We're going to pick up a little bit where we left off last week uh, in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, um, second part of our series on discipleship. Our children's team has been um, discussing our midweek uh, ministry to the children for about a year and a half. And we've been thinking about some different things, and we've been looking at all those things. And <coughs> Sorry, if I have to clear my throat this morning, I've only cleared it about 28 times already this morning. So it's just one of those things. I don't know. I don't know. So um, there are many programs that are out there, and we really were trying to pray about what we wanted to do for our children. And I really shared my burden with the children's team, seven on the children's team, about what I would like to see God do with our children, our elementary school kids and the, the preschool kids. And we want to teach God, the children God's truth. But I also want us to listen to their struggles. And I think that sometimes we do so much talking to the kids, we don't listen back to the kids enough. And they're going through some stuff. They, they are really battling things that uh, I could never even have imagined when I was a kid. And not only teach them, but listen to them. And we need to apply God's truth to their lives, which I think is the desire for them. And then all of us, we need to model the correct behavior before them. They need to see it. They need some role models. They need some mentors. They need to not only hear the talk, they need to see our walk that it's backing that up. And we're really preparing them to receive Christ, receive the gospel. And for some of them that are starting to hear the gospel, we need to start discipling them even now. And, and I've had this burden and this is not a, a I'm not going to veer off and talk about the politics of the world, but um, they're being indoctrinated everywhere. I have an eight-year-old granddaughter. Y'all seen her? Her name's Evangeline. She's quite cute. Got blue eyes, real beautiful. She calls me Pops. Uh, love her to death. Don't get to see her enough. But She's a, a Girl Scout, and I don't know how many kids that they've got in their troop, but she has a boy in their troop, and Girl Scouts. And the mom came and explained it to the troop that uh, though she was, though in her words, she, these pronouns are killing me, though he was born a boy, he now identifies as a girl. Eight years old. The world is disciplining our children. They're discipling, I should say, our children. And what is the church going to do about that? I, I saw a post on Facebook, and they said, tell us what you think about prayer in school. And they're meaning not quiet prayer, but teaching prayer. And I said, no. If that offends you, let me say it a little louder. No. I don't want somebody who I don't know if they know Christ or not teaching my children to pray. I'll teach them to pray. I'll pray with them. We have the church. We'll teach our children. We'll disciple our children. You teach my children math and the read and the write. And... Amen? And, and Leave that stuff alone. I, now, I grew up where in first grade we, we quoted Psalms 100. That's not today. And I don't want that, those things happening. We, we need to understand that <clears throat> we're supposed to follow the biblical mandate that we're going to talk about. It's a commission. We need to make a commitment to that. And it needs to be a strong commitment because the world has made a commitment. And I don't know that you know this or not, but the world is aiming at our children. 
They want your children. They want your grandchildren. For some of you who are so honored and blessed, they want your great-grandchildren. And they want, to see it, they want to see it modeled in the world, and it is. And to that, I want us to pray. Would you bow with me? Father, <clears throat> thank you for the gift of life, for making us the way that we are. Uh, I, I thank you for making me, for giving me a mom and a dad. And I have brothers and I have sisters. <laughs> and I know who I am and my identity is in the reality of how you created me and how you love me. And Father, as a church, we've gone along and we haven't done the job that you've wanted us to do. And I pray that we'll make a commitment to that today. Lord, that we would be strong in our love for everyone and we'll follow the pattern that you set, your word, your truth, that is a blessing to us if we will receive it. I pray we receive it today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If, you're, if you have your Bible, stand with us in honor of reading God's word. <clears throat> Matthew 28, let's begin verse 16. Then the eleven went away into Galilee to the mountains which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know if you could hear Ben on his mic this morning, but that's exactly what he was saying. He was doing it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. You may be seated. Go make disciples. Go tell the good news. Share the good news. Live the good news. Be bold in the good news. Christ is the one that changes us. I haven't saved anybody, but Christ saves us. I haven't done the things of the, the work in their life that needs to be done. Christ does that. But yet, He asks us to come along beside them as the Holy Spirit comes along beside us to make disciples. And literally what He is saying here is, as you go, make disciples. That's what He's saying. And then He says in verse 20, teaching them. Teaching them. The root word there is deo for teaching, <clears throat> which means to learn, to instruct, to instill doctrine, to explain teaching, to expound on a thing. 97 times in 91 verses in the New Testament, this word has been used. So when Jesus was on the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> in Matthew chapter 5, verse 2, it says, Then he opened his mouth and taught them say. And what a sermon it was. Amen? Then in the end of the Sermon on the Mount, verse 29, the reaction was, for he taught them as one having authority, the authority of God. When we teach the Word of God, we're not teaching it in our authority. We're teaching it in God's authority. I've actually had people say, Preacher, when you preach, you preach with passion. And I pray that I always do. But they say, you preach with such authority. If I do, it's not my authority. It's his authority. Because we stand on the promises and the truths and the precepts and the principles of God. And we don't just say those things. We live those things. He said, for you teach them as one having authority and not like the scribes. You know when you feel the authority of God and you know when you don't. Nobody else needs to describe that to you. We know when it's God's Word. But this word teaching means not only to instruct, it also brings this thing in of shared dialogue. Shared dialogue and discussion with others. 
in Robert Coleman's book, The Master's Plan for Evangelism, he said this is how God did it. Jesus chose 12 men. Now, there were more followers that you could actually call disciples. In the upper room, there was 120. There were people that followed at a, at a somewhat close place. You're a good man, Rick. <clears throat> Church, y'all need to give him a promotion. And I have no idea where I was. I just lost train of thought. But it was a good train of thought. When G there it goes. Thank you, Holy Spirit. When, when Jesus was there, there, sometimes he would speak in large crowds. Sometimes he would speak in cities and in synagogues. But he always had a gathering, but he spent most of his time, listen to me, with 12. Most of his ministry was with 12. So that he could teach the 12 and that they could go and reach others. It wasn't just about the large crowds. It wasn't just about addition. It was about multiplication. Teach one who could teach one who could teach one who could teach one. And by the way, if you look at the disciples, they were different. Not one of them was alike. He chose different types of people with different backgrounds. But the same God, the same Savior, the same Holy Spirit leading them. And, and this is what God does. God uses the personality of the tool. So God made me the way that I am. You might not like it. Blame Him. Or Martha and Alton. Blame them. They raised me. I just I am what I am. Sounds like Papa, doesn't it? But uh, just, just listen, we, you, you may not be like me. Don't copy mine. I'm not going to be like you. One of my greatest faults when I became a preacher was trying to, I wanted to preach well, and I had heroes. I, I had a lot of heroes. Billy Graham was a hero of mine. Just the anointing of God that just dripped off of him. Adrian Rogers, Jerry Vines, Ron Dunn, Junior Hill, Manly Beasley. These people were just just amazing people. And I read books of others that went before us, the Spurgeons and all those people. And, and I found out that, that I, I, I can't preach like Charles Stanley. That man, he gets up here and he don't have notes. And he's got 16 points to every sermon. And they all sound good. I get one point. And you kind of go, eh, right? And there are times I'd, I'd find myself acting like people because I, was, I honored them and I mimicked them. But you know what, what happened was I finally found out that God didn't need that person. He had already created that person, was using that person. God just wanted me. And when I quit trying to do all the other stuff or when I realized that and I just became Brian, God began to do a greater work. Now, God will always use the Word, but God wants to use the Word in you. Yes, He taught, but He also taught those who could teach others. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, the Word of God says this. Paul says, Christ we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect and complete in Christ Jesus. That's our commission. 2 Timothy, I love the book of 2 Timothy, Paul's last letter. In the second chapter, in the second verse, he says this, <clears throat> And the things that you have heard from me, among many witnesses, commit these things to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You know what that's called? Discipleship. Teach some who can teach others. Have conversations with some who can have conversations with others. He says in verse 20, Matthew 28, verse 20, teaching them to observe. The word observe means to attend to carefully. 
to watch over it, to guard, to take care of it, teach them to observe. Really what he is saying is this, teach them to observe, which means to observe it, to watch it, but do it. Carefully do it. Teach them what it means to do it. Let them watch you and mentor them. Aren't you grateful you never heard my first sermon? By the way, it was 45 minutes long. I had three points, 15 minutes on each of my three points. I had a preacher there who came just to hear me preach. And I said, how did I do? He said, you did fine. Could have been a little shorter. I'm still battling those things today. Isn't that crazy? Teach them to do. What does this mean practically? It means to have a proper application of Christ's teachings as it is, listen to me now, discussed, learned, and then practiced. Now, this is the time when I preach. They did this even back then. They would go to the synagogues and they would open the scrolls and they would preach the Scripture. But that's not enough. Jesus would preach to large crowds. He would go to the synagogues and all that. But he spent the vast majority, the vast majority of his time talking to people one-on-one, going to houses. And he would be there in a house with no more than four to six people. They'd share a meal, and he would talk to them. He would answer their questions. You see, the Word of God, it's best understood when you get a group of people together and they begin to say, well, I thought it said this. Does it say this? How does that apply to our life? Now, this is the magic. I hope you're hearing me. This is the magic. I, I, I have a small group. I have six people. I'm about to start another one. I'll start as many as it takes, Rick. We, we've got people in here who can do this. We'll do this as a church. You need to be in a small group whether it's Sunday school or, or, or that. But my group, I get a group of men because I want the men to know how men should be in this world. Not what the world says they should be, but what the Word of God says they should be. We need to raise them up. And, and ladies, I've always said girls need girls. You don't need me in that group. Amen? You just, y'all, y'all can talk about us all you want to. Just don't do it in front of me. Titus chapter 2. Y'all need to be there for each other. But you also need to take what God's taught you and share it to the next generation. Here's the magic. In my group, there's six of us. I'll say something or somebody else will say something and then the next person says something and then we're all thinking and we share what we think. And what I have learned is this. It's not the truth that I'm bringing. It's the perspective of the people in the group as they bring them together. I cannot tell you how many times I'll say, you know, I've never looked at it that way because I haven't lived their perspective. I haven't gotten their life uh, understanding. I haven't walked the roads that they've walked. But when they bring it, it's like this absolutely beautiful nugget that opens up and I'm like, okay. And when we do this as a group, People don't go to small groups because they'll say, I'm afraid I'll have to say something. You just say what you want to say. Nobody's going to make you feel bad. But here's my thing. Rick, when when we were talking about this a couple years ago, I said, all you got to do is crank the engine. My job is to keep them, tell them to hush every now and again. Because they're just, it's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's life. Because you see, people are investing in each other. We need the whole group. It's not just me up there talking all the time. I told you last week, you retain how much? 3% of what I say. You get in a small group, you'll retain 20%. You get in a small group where you're discussing it back and forth and everybody's contributing, get this, the retention goes to 40%. I had a person come to me one time and they were talking about, uh, they, they were really apologizing to me. And they said, Pastor, I've got to choose between Sunday school or church. I can't do both. I said, choose Sunday school. 
I would rather you be in a small group than hear me preach. I know you didn't want to say amen, but in your heart you were kind of thinking it. Because that's where the the, the real great thing happens. But what is happening today is what I call reverse discipleship. Christians are taking discipleship lightly. Oh, maybe, yeah, if I have time, I might do that. We just take it lightly. But I understand this, the world is definitely not taking it lightly. They've got an agenda and they are pushing it. And what we're seeing is a downward spiral because of this. Because you see, there's either truth and truth breeds truth. The Word of God is applied to our life. You'll find out that it will not apply to a area of your life. It will apply to 20 areas of your life and it will bless you. But a lie An untruth breeds more lies. And it's like cancer. It's never stagnant. So when when there's an untruth out there, it'll grow and grow and grow. And we've seen that. When I was a young child and they were trying to begin to teach evolution in schools, we could dismiss it very lightly. But y'all know how that's worked. Now they'll say, we know evolution is true. We don't understand it. We don't understand how. That's what they'll tell you. But the, and, and some of them will be so bold to tell you that they know everything and they know how and all that. They're just, the Bible says knowingly, un, un, uh, knowingly ignorant, I think is what the Bible calls it. Right? But now they'll say, I, I don't know everything about evolution, but we know it's true. I'm like, lie begets lie begets lie begets lie. One lie leads to another. And this is the problem. The world's changing us more than we're changing the world. God called us to change the world. But we're being discipled by the world more than the world's being discipled by us. We don't want to fight, so we've become quiet. And we've taken the microphone and handed it to the the idiots. And the idiots are out there. They're just looking for a place to stand up and preach. And with time, you know, I feel for my Methodist brothers and sisters. There was a day in time in our country, then there were more Methodists than there were Baptists. But what they did was they got a progressively uh, more understanding and tried to embrace the things of the world. And they began to watch couple years ago, I believe it was three years ago, that they had a vote in the Methodist church. And around the world, it was, it was overwhelmingly for the truth and the inspired word of God. But in America, it barely passed. So what they said that they had to do was they had to get all these narrow-minded people who believed in the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God out of the leadership in the pulpits, and and they had to get these other people. Now, in the Methodist church, you, you don't pick your pastor. It's sent to you. And the Methodist church owns the building. I have a Methodist, I have a lot of Methodist pastor friends, and he told the bishop, that was the person that was over them, he said to the bishop, he said, we don't believe that, we're not going to do that, and this was their response, we'll padlock your doors. I promise you that was the response. And now they've opened up and they're going to they're gonna let the people choose which way the ways it wants to go. If they would just read Romans 1, they would tell you that that stuff is a doctrinal thing. But what they have done is they have adapted the world's philosophy rather than the Word of God. If you go to the Word of God, it's plain. I feel for them. Because somewhere along the line, good people wanted to be relevant and moved into the, 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 the vein that the world goes and thought that that would be the right thing. It's not the right thing. 
They wanted to be like the world. They wanted the approval of the world. They wanted to follow the truths of the world. They wanted to follow the patterns of the world. Can I tell you the Apostle John's thoughts on this? 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says, Love not the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Did y'all see that up there? For all that is in the world, and this is the three tools that Satan uses, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He doesn't need to come up with a new one. These have been working from the beginning, and he's good at what he does. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Verse 17, and the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. That's what John tells us. Let me tell you what Jesus said about this. Y'all good with that? In Matthew chapter 15, verse number 7, when he's speaking of the scribes, the people who were the people of the book, and the Pharisees who were supposed to be leading Judaism, he called them hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, and here he's quoting Isaiah, these people draw near to me with their mouth, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Why? And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. This is reverse discipleship. What we need is not the discipleship of the world. What we need is to be tied in to the Word of God. We need to have integrity to Scripture. And we need to value people. You're important. Please understand this. In discipleship, it's not just the teachers. The magic, the, the goodness of God, the, the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is when God's people come together and discuss the Word of God together. The Holy Spirit will meet you there. He is the paraclete. That means He is the one who comes along beside us. So when you meet in His name and you discuss His will and His way, He will honor it. Our goal is just to help you fall in love with Jesus more than you ever have before and be a passionate follower of Christ. There was a Russian author by the name of Leo Tolstoy, Tolstoy who said this, everybody thinks they ch of changing the world and no one thinks of changing themselves. Why don't we just start with all of ourselves? Just, You know, the Bible says that Humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. Understand you need this. Don't let Satan take you in your pride and say, I don't need that. It's not important to me. I shouldn't, I, I don't have to value that. You should value it. There was a church in the book of Revelation, the very first church that Jesus spoke to, the church at Ephesus. They had strong theology but they had left their first love. We need the Holy Spirit to blow in the embers of a group of people together who will keep each other accountable, speak life into each other, and allow God to do a great work. Abraham Maslow says this, what a man can be, a man must be. Why is it that God should give so much of this blessing to you and you just ride on the coattails of that? Some of you are so blessed. You have gotten so much giftedness. And you're just keeping it to yourself. And somebody needs that encouragement. Somebody needs your knowledge and your wisdom. Somebody needs your perspective. I've worked with addicts since 1994. It kind of recharges my batteries. I actually like going to the group, and you don't have to convince them that they've got a problem. They know they've got a problem. Their, their lives have fallen a, apart. And when they first come in, man, they're just broken. 
And I've worked with 12-step programs. And I'll, I'll be, be y'all listen. I got to be very careful because some of those 12-step programs have taken the world and let the world in. And they say, oh, you just need a higher power. And you can make a, a paper clip your higher power. You know what that's called? Stupid. There's one God. He is the creator God. He is the sustainer God. He holds the world in his hands. He is God and we are not. But there's a phrase that they say at the end of their meetings. Keep coming back. It works if you work it. Now, hold on. They've just had a discipleship group. There'll be all these people that are there and they'll share their stories and they'll talk about the truths and they'll start applying those truths to their life. And, and maybe they'll come with their, their pail empty and somebody else will encourage them and, and fill it up. Most of the, I believe in one step, not 12 steps. I don't have a problem with any of the 12 steps, but I believe in taking one step and that's Christ and Christ alone, the hope of glory. And, and being modeled back in the image of Christ. But I don't have a problem with going through all of those things. But there's a phrase that I think you need to hear. Listen, and you're, if you've been a Christian for a while, you need to hear this. When you stop doing the things that made you what you are, you cease to be the person that you had become. We all need to continue to be discipled. We need personal discipleship, prayer, time in the Word of God. We need, to, we need to, that, that time of listening before God. But we also understand that we need to be in a group where I may be lacking, but you may be there to help me. I may be there, and I can help you there when you're lacking. This is God's structure. The church is growing rapidly around the world, just not here in America. Why is this happening? How, how are they doing it? Is it because of buildings and structures? Lord knows we got plenty of buildings and structures in America. And if you go to other places, they may have great buildings, cathedrals that are empty. But all over the world, Christians are sharing their faith and people are getting saved and they're getting together, whether it may be in their house, it might be in a hut, it may be that they meet in some other place. They don't have the building that we have. Jesus didn't either. It's not the buildings and the structures. It's not the Bible colleges and the seminaries. If that were the case, America would be the most holy nation in the world. We've got the Bible schools, we've got the seminaries, and we're producing it. But look, I love what a, a R.G. Lee said in, in, in 1974. It was a, a, a million more in 1974. That was their slogan. And R.G. Lee says, if we get a million more like we have right now, we're going to go bankrupt. We need to produce what God wants us to produce. Acts chapter 20. I promise you this is my last scripture. Paul had gone to the church at Ephesus. He had been there for a while and he was coming back to visit them. And he wanted to encourage them. His life was about to change. He was about to go back to Jerusalem. He was about to be arrested and sent to Rome where he would stand before Caesar. But as he's there at Ephesus, he's reminding them. Listen to what Paul said under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. When they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears, and with trial. Oh God, that we would have more tears. With the trials that come with living a godly life, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful for you. I kept back nothing that was helpful, but, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from... 
He said, when I had you all together, I taught you the Word of God. When we weren't all together, we did it house to house. You want to hear the amazing thing? In that providence, that we would call it today modern-day Turkey, there they went out, and it says, everyone in Asia Minor had heard the gospel. It wasn't the mass meetings in the big buildings. It was Christians who took it with them. And they didn't do it as lone rangers. When Jesus sent people out, he sent them out how? You think he expected accountability? You think the even the 12 disciples that Jesus discipled, there was still a group of three, a group of three, a group of three, and a group of three. So he could spend time with them. Church, why don't we follow his example? I said something about the Methodist church. By, by the way, I, I hope you didn't feel I was being critical. I feel for my brothers and sisters and what they're going through. But I need to tell you the rest of the story. Have y'all ever heard of a man by the name of John Wesley? He was the one who was really the founder of the Methodist church. Mark, Rick, they read a book about this with me. And as we read that book together, we, we, they, they talked about Wesley and the, and the Methodist churches and how they would go to, into the very small cities and villages and a church would be established there. And what they would do in every little place where a church was established, they would set up small groups. And then they got modernized. And they went from small groups to bigger groups because everybody likes big. And then the bigger groups begin to shrink back down to a small group. And they combine them again or do away with them. And what made the Methodist church is the power of God. But they became the largest number of churches out there because they stayed strong together in the teaching together but it was, it was the accommodation in the small groups. Some of those Methodist churches, a, a pastor would pastor four different churches. It wasn't about the pastor. They would have had to get it in one sermon for a month. But those small groups kept them together. And when they quit doing that, the Methodist church has been on a downward spiral ever since. Numbers don't lie. And Baptist, if we're not careful, we're going to follow the example. God forbid. I just don't know why people don't want to come. I just don't know why. Maybe we need to make it personal. Where there can be, and I say this in the most reverent way I know how to say it. Intimate discussion. Supporting each other. Praying for each other and with each other. Loving each other. Checking on each other. Being like Christ. That's right. God help us get back to the main things that Jesus taught us. As you go, make disciples. Teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. And I'll be with you always. Even to the end of the world, the end of the age.